And it, it looks like the book's arrived, so that's great. Fantastic. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, introduce you to this guitar and some of the stories behind it, some of the things it does, and some of the people that it's met and places it's been along the way. Um, back in March of 1995, uh, as Peter said, I met this guy, George Rosani. This was at a do-it-yourself fair in Toronto, so there was the, uh, you know, make your own, ferment your own yogurt, uh, <laughs> brew your own beer, build your own patio deck, and the make your own guitar guy. Um, and, you know, I know uh, enough about guitar making to sound smart at a cocktail party, so I pulled out my best, uh, so is that Brazilian rosewood, uh, Japanese maple, uh, you know. These are the things I know you're supposed to make guitars with. And George said something very interesting. He said, he said, you know, I, I'm not really a big believer in the exotic woods because for one thing, they skew the local economies where they come from. It's bad for the environment. And finally, we have some of the best woods in the world in Canada, and mostly we put them on the backs of trucks and ship them to the United States to be turned into toilet paper and sold back to us. Um, it seems like a, an ill use of the, of the material. So with those rather profound words uh, ringing in my head, I, I was thinking of what was upcoming for us all in October of that year, when this question was to be pro uh, posed to Quebecers about whether or not to <clears throat> set off on their own trajectory and start their own country. And, you know, I actually kind of understood that impulse because unlike almost anywhere else in Canada, with the possible exception of Newfoundland, um, there is such a strong uh, cultural center of gravity in Quebec. And it seemed to me that this was a place that sort of understood uh, its, its place uh, and its potential and all that kind of stuff, whereas most of the rest of English Canada tends to just wring its hands all the time. And, and I thought, wow, if we could capture some of that mojo, that would be great. The problem was, uh, as that debate kind of uh, ramped up over that summer, most of it uh, was cast in terms of dry constitutional arguments, red versus blue, Quebec versus Ottawa, English versus French. And it, all the other possibilities got lost. So although the, the vote uh, came down, as you know, very, very closely in favor of, of a united Canada, um, <clears throat> We, we missed the opportunity to talk about all the other things that Canada is. I mean, nobody asked me in downtown Toronto what Canada meant to me, and nobody asked anyone in Iglulik what Canada meant to them, and nobody asked First Nations people what Canada was to them, and nobody asked newcomers what Canada was to them. And to me, this was a great missed opportunity to have that conversation. And so although Canada ostensibly won the debate, uh, we were left with this question mark about, well, who are we really? What is the nature of this place? And the problem is there's a vacuum there, because whenever we want to talk about who we are, we result to these very, very stale symbols. And it doesn't mean I have anything against hockey or donuts or uh, beer. Um, uh, I, s I still felt that these were, um, they're kind of cartoon characters that don't really speak to who we are. Um, and don't give us the opportunity to really talk about what Canada is, which is far more interesting. So with George's words fresh in my ears, uh, I set about to create a new kind of icon um, that would incorporate different materials that told more stories, that included more people. Um, so these uh, uh, fragments that you're seeing on the screen here, um, you know, some of these things are very, very famous. Um, some of them are not. Some of them are quite literally uh, salvaged from the bottom of Halifax Harbor. Some of them picked up off the tundra in uh, northern Quebec um, from uh, construction um, uh, renovation at the Library of Parliament. Uh, all of these things are very, very different. What's, what they have in common is that each of them tells a story, and each of them is part of this one guitar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you, uh, well, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you first that there are 64 pieces. Um, uh, there's 63 in the guitar itself. There's a 64th on the strap. And I'll show you a little bit later some of the other pieces that we've added to the case uh, in recent years. The guitar nick and the nickname Voyageur, the Festival de Voyageur in uh, Manitoba uh, in 2008, in February, I might add. Um, <clears throat> So I'll take you inside the guitar now and show you just a few pieces. Uh, this, of course, is the province of Quebec. The northern part is the Inuit territory known as Nunavik. Um, it is an area that is quite sparsely populated by human beings. 
uh, although quite generously populated by caribou. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, caribou uh, is a big part of life, uh, culture, art, commerce, economy, you name it, uh, diet. Um, and I happened to find a young artist by the name of Charlene Watt from Kujuac in northern Quebec, and she carved for us from caribou antler this little ulu. This is a women's knife. Um, it's just an ornamental one. It's made from caribou antler with a couple of little soapstone rivets that you might see there. Uh, and we found a place for this on the fifth fret of the guitar. Uh, the guy holding the guitar happens to be Senator Charlie Watt. This picture was taken just over here at the, uh, at the South Block. Uh, and he only found out that his daughter made this contribution about an hour before this photo was taken. So it was a really <laughs> sweet, sweet moment. One of my favorite places to see uh, music in the world, uh, Massey Hall on Shooter Street in Toronto, um, faced the wrecking ball in the 1970s, but uh, avoided that, uh, undergoing a fantastic renovation today. Apart from being a great place for music, I mean, Winston Churchill spoke there, um, uh, the Dalai Lama spoke there, boxing matches were held there, uh, public meetings, union meetings. Um, when soldiers were sent off to war, it was often at ceremonies uh, held here. So a very important place in the community. Um, due to its recent renovations, we managed to get seat number 69 from the gallery. Um, section, uh, which is a, a, one of the best seats if you ever go there, um, and that is now the headstock of the guitar, as well as a couple of other little uh, ornamental elements. 1954-55 <clears throat> uh, season, of course, uh, Maurice Rocket Richard was benched by League Commissioner Cl Clarence Campbell, meaning that the Habs lost to the Detroit Red Wings in the Stanley Cup. That year, the riots ensued when Clarence Campbell showed up at the forum like an idiot. Um, <laughs> Um, the following year was a rematch between Detroit and Montreal, and uh, in the uh, final minutes of, I believe it was game six, Maurice Richard scored the winning goal, uh, setting off a chain reaction of five Stanley Cups in a row for Montreal. Now at the time, if you were on a Stanley Cup winning team, the league would give you a platter, silver platter. Now I know some people think it's cool to wear a silver platter around your neck these days. <laughs> However, at the time, not done. Uh, and the Richard family felt something a bit more portable would be more appropriate. So they commissioned for the entire team a set of rings. This is the one they commissioned for Maurice himself. You'll see his name and number, the Stanley Cup. There's a little depiction of the Montreal Forum on the other side. Uh, my friend uh, Dave bought this at auction when um, <clears throat> the Richard family was getting rid of a bunch of memorabilia. Uh, just before the Quebec government swooped in and bought the remainder of the lot. He paid about 8,000 US for this, which I know his wife thought was a mistake. Um, <laughs> uh, and then he made the mistake of telling me that he had bought it, and I said, well, Dave, I really need a piece of that ring. <laughs> <laughs> and he agreed. Uh, we went down to Harborfront Center to the craft studio there, and the jeweler, uh, Bevan Jennings, uh, advised that there was a slim chance of doing some structural damage, but she thought it would be okay, and Dave turned to me and said, you realize this is my daughter's college fund, right? <laughs> and I said, don't worry. Uh, Bevan, uh, <laughs> Bevan cut off a tiny dot of gold, and it is now in the middle of the ninth fret of this guitar. Um, I like to think it looks like one of Maurice's eyes. The, the, the border is, the white of the eye is uh, Moose Antler from Pick River First Nation on Lake Superior. The blue is Labradorite from Nain Labrador, and then that lovely golden pupil. Nancy Green, uh, our, one of the torch lighters, one of the successful torch lighters. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and of course, Canada's first uh, Winter Olympic um, uh, ski medalist uh, with a gold and a silver in Grenoble, France in 1968. This is one of the skis that she used that year in France. Uh, and a section of that is now one of the reinforcing strips on the inside of the guitar, um, on the inside back of the guitar. You can see it just through the sound hole. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, of course. Now, I'm, I'm going to hope that some of you can hear this little clip that's about to come. Um, I knew I wanted something from Pierre's, uh, if you will, secular life, not his political life, but, you know, he's such a charismatic guy, and, and so many people had this picture of Pierre as this great outdoorsman, and, of course, he's very active in, in uh, Nahani National Park and other national parks. Um, and everybody had that image of him in that buckskin jacket with Canada written across the, the, ja the back, and I wanted something from that. The Canoe Museum in Peterborough was bust at the time, and you couldn't get in, and I knew they had some stuff. And I was lucky enough to bump into Justin Trudeau one day. And I uh, told him what I was trying to do, and he said, gee, I don't think we have anything, but I'll, I'll, I'll look for you. 
And he took my number, and soon after, I got this message. Hi, Joey. It's Justin Trudeau calling. Uh, I got your message, and the guitar sounds like an amazing project. Uh, my brother and I had a look around, and we found one of Dad's favorite paddles I think you can use. Uh, it's in kind of rough shape. Not much use for a canoe trip anymore, but uh, it may just sound fantastic in a guitar. Hope this helps. Keep in touch. Bye. Nice, eh? He put that in the mail. Uh, we, in turn, sent it down to um, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, where it was cut down and built in as a tone, what they call a tone bar, just inside the inside of the sound hole. Now the crazy thing is, of course, we're very keen to put this guitar in people's hands. Um, <clears throat> uh, we want this to be a tactile experience for many people as possible. And a strange phenomenon has developed, or I've noticed a strange phenomenon, which is that a very large number of women want to touch Pierre Trudeau's canoe paddle. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But it, this happens all across the country, I'm not lying. Uh, it just so happens I was at the, uh, the bar at the Chateau Laurier the other night and Justin was there, so he finally was reunited with his, uh, that little bit of his father's paddle. John Ware was born into slavery in South Carolina in 1845. Uh, when the Emancipation Act was signed in 1863, he moved to Texas where he learned the ranching business. From there he moved up to Montana and Idaho. From Idaho he joined a cattle drive to Alberta. The first one, in fact. And John Ware is credited with bringing the ranching industry to Alberta. He fell in love with the Red Deer River, River area, settled along there, built a cabin, raised a family of five. He died in 1905, 12 days after Alberta became a province, and it was the biggest funeral the young city of Calgary had ever seen. Now that's part of black history that almost nobody that I've met in Canada knows, including a lot of people from Alberta. In spite of the fact that there's a monument to John Ware on the uh, Stampede Grounds, there's John Ware Ridge, uh, and a bunch of other uh, monuments to him. His cabin uh, was moved um, to uh, Dinosaur Provincial Park in Drumheller. I called them up and they gave me a little fragment from uh, one of the end of the logs. And that is now um, the top of the pick guard assembly on the guitar. So you'll see that the pick guard is that kind of um, a half maple leaf on the diagonal there, and I'll just run through some of the other pieces there. Uh, that's, uh, th there's four elements in that uh, stem of the maple leaf. The first one is from the top of Paul Henderson's stick from the 1972 Canada Russia series. Uh, next to that is a piece of the Wildcat Cafe, the oldest building in Yellowknife, uh, replicated at the Museum of Civilization here, by the way. Uh, next to that, a uh, seat from the old Montreal Forum, now the Forum Pepsi, I hate to say. Um, and uh, finally, one of Gretzky's sticks. The side element, you'll see it's got that reddish color, and this is an early photo, that's faded quite a bit, but that's um, red ochre from Conception Bay, Newfoundland, as a tribute to the Biotic people who were wiped out uh, by the uh, European settlers. Um, the inset is one of 38,000 wooden nickels made from salvage from the third mate of the mist that burned in Dry Dock in 1955. Uh, and the greater piece on the outside is from James Naismith's house, the inventor of basketball from Almont, Ontario. Um, I just happened to run into another, well, in fact, a James Naismith Award winner. Uh, that's Steve Nash, uh, photographed just a little while ago. This is the story I really want to tell you about. Um, this, this is not a photoshopped image. Uh, this is uh, the legendary golden spruce of Haida Gwaii, a tree that by rights should not have survived. It had no chlorophyll in its needles. So um, the chlorophyll not only helps the tree to breathe, it also keeps it cool. Um, and this tree should have burned up internally. It didn't because it was uh, protected, as you can see, by the large number of trees. Uh, tall trees surrounding it, protected also by the often rainy and cloudy weather on Haida Gwaii, where this is situated, um, but protected by a few other things as well, uh, by the tourist industry um, in Haida Gwaii, which depended on a lot of people coming to see it, uh, the scientific community who wanted to study it and came in droves to do that, uh, by the Haida community for whom this was a sacred tree, uh, containing the spirit of one of their ancestors, a small boy named Kid Kias. Uh, and, um, uh, also protected, strangely, by the Macmillan Bladell Paper Company. Uh, they had the logging rights to this area and could have cut it down if they wanted to, but they knew how important this tree was, and so they kept a very, very uh, safe distance from it. And um, uh, unfortunately, there was a guy who worked for them as a logging scout. Uh, I won't say his name, but you can read his story in this remarkable book. Um, and he felt, uh, just maybe from being in the forest too long, 
Um, he felt that it was hypocritical of the company that they would spend so much energy preserving this one tree while they clear cut so many other trees. So one night in January of 1997, he uh, got into a kayak at Prince Rupert, BC on the mainland, paddled across a very dangerous stretch of, stretch of water known as the Hecate Strait, down the Yukon River, which is actually an inlet towards Port Clements, where the tree is. And there on the bank, he pulled a chainsaw out of his kayak. Oh no. And he cut it down. Uh, it took three days for this tree to fall. And the height of people that I met said that for them this was a drive-by shooting. And they couldn't understand why anyone would do such a thing. The height at that point said that this was it. They would not touch this tree. They would let it return to the earth in spirit and substance. I had the good fortune of meeting David Suzuki, who uh, I've been corresponding with a little bit. He told me the story I just told you. And he said, I think we can get a piece of this for your guitar. And he introduced me to the community in Masset and Old Masset, and we began an 18-month dialogue, which ended up with us going into the forest in February of 2006 with Leo Gagnon, a carver, and uh, an elder named Frank Collison. And on that day, <coughs> uh, that's Leo there in the middle with the chainsaw, Frank at the right, um, Sid Bob at the far left for watchers of CBC Kids Television. Um, we were the only people ever to take a piece from this tree. This photo was taken about two minutes after that wood came out of that tree. We all stood around and looked at it for a while, and then Leo said to me, well, it's yours now. You've got to carry it out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it's this big thing this high, and I hoisted it up on my shoulder, and I'm walking the trail out, and Leo's behind me, and he says, there we go again, eh? Another white man walking out of the forest with our stuff. <laughs> We went straight to a mill, planed that off. Uh, we shipped this to Pinehurst, Nova Scotia, and that is now the whole top of the guitar. It's the whole face, it's the face and the voice of this guitar. It's what gives it its character. It's quite an extraordinary gift, and that's why I choke up every time I talk about it. Um, we went back to Haida Gwaii and did some photos with some folks at the uh, Edge of the World Festival in 2008, including Mo Ingram here, who was um, introduced to us as a cousin of the spirit of the tree. Uh, Gu Zhao, the president of the Council of Haida Nations, who's a pretty awesome cat, um, who uh, was helpful in, a, in so many ways. Um, uh, well, in fact, Gu Zhao was helpful in a lot of ways because he kept bringing people up to get their photos taken. He came up with his <laughs> daughter, and he came up with this guy, and uh, <laughs> came up with these guys. Um, he really, he said to me at the time, he said, you know, with this guitar you've done something no politician could ever do. And that's probably one of the most profound and wonderful things anyone's ever said to me about this project. Uh, not to say that we uh, <laughs> avoid politicians entirely. Um, in fact, uh, we, we count um, <laughs> political friends of all stripes. Um, and most of them, you know, Alan, you know Bob Ray is a musician. Peter McKay had that awesome rock star pose. Uh, this is Alan Tonks, um, who at the, mo at the moment we took this picture is playing Universal Soldier by Buffy St. Marie, believe it or not. Um, Jack Layton, uh, every time this guitar comes out somewhere, he's there being photographed. With it. <laughs> There's uh, David Millard, uh, the mayor of Toronto, doing his best Gene Simmons impression. Uh, unfortunately, this guy never managed to look all that comfortable. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Uh, it took six weeks uh, after the 11 years of doing the research and uh, talking to people and uh, gathering the materials. Um, it really only took six weeks to build the guitar. It made its debut on Canada Day on Parliament Hill in 2006. We've been back for Canada Day every year since. Stephen Fearing was the first person to officially play it. Um, it was played by everybody on the bill that night. It was a pretty extraordinary uh, experience. Um, and uh, since then we've been traveling. We've clocked now about 250,000 kilometers going back and forth across the country, uh, visiting some of the, the key places in the Canadian imagination, but also going to some of the places that the guitar is from. There is some of the big nickel from Sudbury is in the guitar. That's uh, Glenn Gould's piano uh, down the road at the uh, Library and Archives. That's Stomp and Tom's Schoolhouse in Skinner's Pond, PEI, and the first Hudson's Bay store in Iqaluit. Um, as important as those places are, for us it's key that uh, people get a chance to get close to this. So uh, we've now had this guitar in the hands of 
tens of thousands of people uh, all across the country uh, doing all kinds of community presentations. Um, yeah, uh, school visits, we do a lot of school visits. Um, and what's been extraordinary to me is the kind of things that the students have developed out of the project on their own. Uh, book reports, um, banners, murals, history projects, uh, special library selections. I've had culinary arts classes do guitar-shaped cookies and cakes <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that they've sold in the cafeteria. Um, Here's the killer. Uh, this is uh, from page 107 of a new math uh, textbook for Western Canada. It's a problem about the guitar. Um, now, I was told there would be no math, but uh, uh, <laughs> somebody else coming. This is a, a mural on the back of Lee's Palace in Toronto. Uh, done by two young artists, Kedry Brown and Jesse Pacho, and the great uh, coincidence here is they included as part of their mural of the guitar a little portrait of um, Julie Black there, so that, uh, that worked out very nicely. Um, uh, this is, of course, the book that you now all have, and um, the coin from the Royal Canadian Mint uh, that goes off sale, and I found out all about how it works last night. Any, they've now sold about 14,000 of these things. Uh, it's a 30,000 mintage um, uh, that goes off sale April 14th at noon, and any that aren't sold that the Mint has on, st on stock, they destroy. So uh, get yours while you still can. Uh, the guitar has been played by hundreds of musicians all across Canada, around campfires, concert stages, festivals, uh, clubs, you name it. Um, it's quite an extraordinary thing for me to witness because it's a huge honor to see this guitar brought to life by musicians. And I believe we have someone here to do that for us today, do we not? Where's our guitar playing, folks? Don't tell me. There we go. Okay, we'll do that. Um, what's really extraordinary is, you know, you watch a musician uh, approach this guitar and, uh, and they kind of feel it out, find its voice, their voice, where they meet, and uh, the results are magical. So let's do this uh, real quick. Do you want, you ready? Yeah, sure. 